I wanted to talk a little bit today about what it's like as a DAP developer to think about uh, sharded blockchains, in particular asynchronous communication between smart contracts. Um, so, you know, from the introduction, you know that I, I'm one of the co-creators of CryptoKitties. I was also the original author of ERC721. Uh, I contributed quite a bit on the upcoming Cheese Wizards game, uh, and we'll actually have a little bit more information about that in the middle of this presentation. Um, and then I'm the chief architect of the upcoming uh, Flow blockchain. In computer science, we like to have these uh, toy versions of abstract problems because it makes it easier for us to think through them. Um, I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with the Byzantine generals problem. Um, it's probably the most famous one uh, is, is the traveling salesman problem uh, as, as a way of thinking about how to build a spanning path through, a, through an arbitrary uh, weighted graph. Um, and, and then my personal favorite is the dining philosophers problem that uh, asks you to imagine that a group of philosophers is eating dinner together and not only can they not eat unless they're holding a fork in each hand, but they're actually sharing their forks after they've gone into each other's mouths. It's, it's quite amazing. Um, but, but we have these, these problems because um, the problems themselves are so abstract that they're hard for, our, ourselves, they're hard for us to reason about. And so we, we create these, these stories, these toy stories, um, that are maybe a little bit disconnected from reality, but they let us use our, our human intuition about how to solve them. And there's a common one that comes up in the Ethereum community, or at least that's where I saw it first, and it's called the train and hotel problem. And it's, um, if, if you search on E3 search, there's a, there's a bunch of great articles about uh, people having ideas on how to solve the train and hotel problem. Um, and, and it's fundamentally how to solve the problem of asynchronous communications between smart contracts that live on different shards. And so the toy version of the problem says, hey, you're traveling to a city, um, and you need a train ticket in order to get there, uh, and you need a hotel a room when you get there, and uh, you don't want to pay for a train ticket until you know that you've got a hotel room, and, but you don't want to book a hotel room unless you're going to be able to get a train ticket. And so if the train was on a smart contract on one shard, um, and the, the hotel was a smart contract on another shard, um, how do you go about solving the problem of booking both of those things um, without uh, potentially being in a situation where you've, you've got one without the other? Um, and, you know, there's, there's a few interesting solutions to this problem. Some of the um, uh, more interesting are, you know, the ability to actually move smart contracts from one shard to another, uh, which, you know, has the potential problem of leading to denial of service attacks. Um, the idea of, of mining two shards or synchronizing two shards so that the validators are, uh, are trying to solve the two blocks on two shards at the same time to allow synchronous communication between the smart contracts on those two shards, um, which doesn't scale if you want to have three smart contracts talk to, talking to each other. Um, and so usually most people think that the best way to solve this is just to have some sort of state locking mechanism where you can you know, more or less put a reservation in for the train um, that is cancelable and then you go and you book the hotel and if that's successful you, you follow through on the train reservation. If it's unsuccessful then you can cancel the train reservation. So that toy problem, I think, is, is useful, but, but I think it's limited because it's so simple. And so I want to talk about something that is, maybe seems even more simple, um, but is actually a little bit more basis in reality, and that's Kitty Hats. So Kitty Hats is a project uh, that was created outside of Dapper to, uh, as an extension to CryptoKitties, and it let you put cool hats and other paraphernalia on your, on your cats. Um, and it was a set of smart contracts that um, leveraged our smart contracts, but we didn't even know they were doing it, let alone <laughs> have any, uh, any special hooks for them to, to be able to do this stuff. Um, and it, it really you know, showed the team and how one of the properties of blockchain that we, that we weren't really expecting when we started building CryptoKitties, and that's this idea of extensibility or composability. So this is sort of what a, a Kitty Hats implementation would look like if you imagine that Kitty Hats used a stable coin in, instead of just ETH. So if a user wants to go and buy a hat to put on their cat, the, um, they, they go through this, this single transaction where they, they send a, a request to the Kitty Hat sales contract, and that contract, through a series of, of synchronous calls to other smart contracts, is able to verify that all the things that need to happen can happen. Um, so the first thing it does is it checks the CryptoKitty smart contract to ensure that the kitty exists and that the person who's trying to put a hat on it is actually the owner of it because you can't put a hat on somebody else's 
I can't put a hat on somebody else's kitty. That would, uh, that would just be absurd. It, makes, it transfers the, uh, the stable coin over, um, which you know, will fail if, if the funds are not available. And then finally, it'll put the, cat, the hat on the cat, um, which also could fail uh, potentially if the, the kitty already had a hat um, and there was a conflict there. Um, but the nice thing about a single uh, atomic transaction is even if that last part fails, everything you just seamlessly gets unwound as the, as the transaction reverts. But what if we had that same scenario where we had these you know, four smart contracts working together, um, but each of them was on a different shard? Well, it suddenly becomes a much more complicated solution. Um, so in, in the, this solution that I've shown here, and it's not necessarily the only solution, but it was frankly the best I could come up with, um, it involved locking up the uh, assets that were involved in the transaction before the transaction took place. So you'll see, say, see there in block one, the user is locking up their cat, making sure that that cat can't be transferred um, while the rest of the transaction is, or the rest of the interaction is taking place. They're locking up their stable coin and they're locking up that hat. Um, and then once they have like sort of a receipt from each of those other shards saying, hey, these, these things are locked up, they can't change their state or, or change their ownership, um, then it can go to the sales contract and say, okay, it's safe to, to send a message to all these other contracts and allow these, these transfers to go through. Um, and, and you'll see here, and I haven't explained all of the, the bits and bobs here, but what was the single transaction on a single shard is um, when it's across four shards, it's now 11 transactions and it's taking seven blocks, um, possibly much more if those cross shard uh, interaction calls uh, can't happen in subsequent blocks, which um, many designs don't allow. And this kind of interaction between smart contracts is, is hardly theoretical. Um, you know, you, you, I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with all of the awesome projects in the DeFi space. And Compound can't exist without DAI. Um, 0x is not interesting unless it's talking to a bunch of ERC20 tokens. And all of these projects are um, building on top of each other, and most of them would be um, difficult, if not intractable, to build if they had to deal with asynchronous communication with those other smart contracts. So I want to talk about another revolution that happened, um, and sort of the peak of that revolution, the open source revolution, was in the year 2000. Um, and in, in 2000, everyone was really excited about open source and it was gonna, it was gonna completely transform software. And, and it did, but not the way people thought. In 2000, people expected that Linux on the desktop was we're gonna replace Windows. And software like OpenOffice and the GIMP was gonna replace Microsoft Office and Photoshop. And, and that's not what happened at all. The open source revolution was real and it completely changed the way that we think about and make software. Um, but it looks like this. It's a bunch of little tiny components that are built on top of each other. And some of those components aren't so tiny, right? They're, they're significant. But what the power of them is that they're not solving a particular user problem. It's that they consist of a set of, it's, they're a set of tools that different people can create different solutions out of. And I believe that the real power of smart contracts, if we think of them in that way, as, a, as building blocks that are, um, you know, each building on the next and working together to create lots of solutions and not just these monolithic things that are just replacing one institution at a time with replacing one institution with one smart contract. And so if you ever see people talking about uh, the train and hotel problem, I want you to imagine in your head, well, yeah, okay, maybe they've solved the train and hotel problem, but have they solved the train, hotel, restaurant reservation, movie tickets, tour bus um, problem? Because I think that in reality, smart contracts, it's very rarely one smart contract needing to talk to another. It's, it's a multiple. And that term that has come to uh, express this is, is composability. Um, and, and I truly believe that composability could, is the superpower of smart contracts. You see here a quote from uh, Jesse Walden of Andreessen Horowitz, and he wrote a great piece talking about composability. And I think the, you know, the key phrase in there is compounding innovation. The fact that it's not one person or one team that needs to make one giant step of innovation. It's that everybody can contribute a little bit, and that compounds over time. And as we all know, compounding growth is exponential, and there's no more powerful force in the world. Rated R for ridiculous.
visit cheesewizard.com to summon today. Thank you. So that was cool and all, but what the heck does it have to do with smart contracts and composability? Um, the team at Dapper Labs uh, was so inspired by the example of Kitty Hats that when we built our new game, Cheese Wizards, uh, we were bought into the notion of composability and extensibility on day one. And so uh, over the last six weeks or so, we've been running a hackathon uh, with uh, a bunch of community support and, and prizes because we wanted to kickstart the, the, uh, the community's creation of some amazing tools. Um, and there's a couple of them I just wanted to highlight right here. So on the right, my, Mark uh, Pereira um, did a mobile version of our, of our, of our battle game. Um, it's a, you know, it, Cheese Wizards is a game where you buy wizards and you fight them and there's, it's, a, you know, it's the land of Highlander. There can be only one and whoever wins the big cheese uh, we'll take home a, a big old pot of ether. Um, and uh, you know, our team didn't have the time to build a, a native mobile app, and so uh, Mark took it upon himself to build one, which is amazing. Uh, there's Cheese Dow over there, which I think is incredible. Um, I, I don't know if we would have thought of that ourselves. Um, it, it's the ability for anyone to create a DAO, multiple DAOs, uh, if, if they want. And it's an interesting sort of DAO where the voting power in those DAOs is not based on who's contributed the most tokens, but uh, who's been the most successful in the game. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that, that um, is possible when you are building platforms uh, that don't have platform risk, and that's that's what I think is the the is the real power of smart contracts. And so, I think we've seen this in a bunch of places, and I think that this is going to be the story of uh, smart contract platforms in the future if we let it. Um, but I get real worried because. I fear that if composability is the superpower of blockchain, that sharding, and in particular asynchronous, forcing asynchronous communications between smart contracts um, could be uh, its kryptonite. Thank you. <laughs>